Okay, uh, so uh, let's begin with uh, the second half of the workshop. Uh, and uh, we will have uh, the first talk by David Wallace. Uh, I thought it was supposed to be on the two-part paper, but <laughs> the title here is from the observability paper. But anyway, he is promising to uh, tell us about uh, his uh, symmetry research in around half an hour. Uh, so David, please. Thank you, yes. Um, so a curse of the pandemic is it's become almost, I mean, relatively minor as curses go. It's been impossible to work out what you've, what, which people have heard which things where. So I've given versions of this material in various places, um, and I can only apologise to those who've heard fragments of it previously. Uh, at least in on the East Coast, it's just after lunch. So if you want to multitask, having heard the talk before with catching up on sleep, I sh shall not be in the slightest offended and shall not make any adverse inferences from people doing so. OK, um, <clears throat> symmetry is weirdly more interesting and important in physics and in the interpretation of physics than you'd think. I mean, and you first run into the extent to which physicists care about symmetry when you're an undergrad studying physics or uh, trying to get interested in physics on the side, it can seem that people are a little fixated on what looks like a sort of relatively technical workaday concept. And just as a sort of reminder and a focus, I mean, here are non exhaustively, I think, here's a list of observations that are varyingly made and defended about symmetry by serious people in physics and in philosophy. Zoom. <clears throat> There's an unobservability thesis that symmetry related states of affairs are empirically indistinguishable. We saw some of this coming up in, in Dave's very nice talk earlier. Um, some sense in which you know, if I've got a quantity that um, if I've got some transformation that takes situation A to situation B, somehow it's impossible to tell which of situation A or situation B actually obtains. Then there's a representational equivalence thesis. If I've got, uh, this is more at the formal level, I've got, uh, I've got a model that supposedly represents some system, and I've got another model I get by applying some symmetry transformation <coughs> to that system. Somehow those symmetry-related models are equally well suited to represent a given physical system. You know, it doesn't, there's no fact of the matter as to which of these is the right way to represent the system. There's a related but not the same modal equivalence thesis, um, which uh, is more the um, substantive than the formal level. If I've got a state of affairs related to another state of affairs by a symmetry transformation, I haven't really got two states of affairs at all. At most, I've got a redescription of the same state of affairs. <clears throat> And I've got a surplus structure thesis. There's some idea that if there are features of, of my model that are variant under symmetries, and I've got, say, an absolute space that isn't preserved by the boost symmetries of my theory, the theory is in some sense deficient. Um, how to cash out that deficiency is contested, but in some sense, then <coughs> uh, this is a guide to reformulating the theory or maybe a guide to which bits of the theory are just um, descriptive fluff in John Ehrman's trenchant term. Uh, in any case, the symmetry is supposed to be a guide to which bits of the machinery of the theory aren't doing any work and should be discarded if we can manage to work, to work out how to do it. So that's a lot that we can get from symmetry and the list isn't even exhaustive. And so the obvious question to ask is why? How does it follow from <clears throat> this relatively technical notion in physics that all of these very substantial interpretive uh, results are supposed to hold. And, and even to answer that, ask that question, uh, we need to get a bit clearer on what we even mean by symmetry. Uh, and, uh, and the question about what symmetry is supposed to mean really can't be entirely disconnected from these supposed things we can derive from it. But the notion of symmetry I'm mostly interested in is uh, what's come to be called the dynamical notion of symmetry, which is also the notion that Dave is talking about. A uh, dynamical symmetry of a physical theory is a transformation applied to that theory, which takes solutions of the equations of motion to other solutions of the equations of motion. <coughs> so this is now an extremely formal notion. Um, it's, um, this is a technical thing where you can check if a transformation is a symmetry or not by looking at the dynamics of the theory, very close to the kind of machinery physics side of how these things are done. There seems to be little or nothing interpretation about it. <clears throat> and yet it's claimed varyingly that um, this dynamical conception of symmetry 
somehow can underpin all of that sort of interpretational and epistemic and metaphysical good stuff. And that might be seen as too good to be true. In fact, has widely been claimed to be too good to be true. <clears throat> so you can make this objection at a rather sort of general, how is it possible level? You could say, and people like Das Gupta have said, this is just a formal dynamical feature of theory. How is it even logically possible that a formal dynamical feature of theory could have substantive implications for our epistemology, for our metaphysics, for the conceptual interpretation of the theory? Then we have a separation here between the dynamics of a theory and the content of a theory. And isn't it just not on the table for um, a formal notion like the dynamical conception of symmetry to have these kind of consequences? <coughs> There's a different and I think ultimately more powerful set of objections, which is that unless we qualify, and again, this was hinted at at the beginning of Dave's talk, unless we qualify um, the formal definition of symmetry somehow, the dynamical definition somehow, we run into dynamical symmetries, which clearly can't have these consequences. So the most straightforward example here is just something like, yeah, my symmetry is ab arbitrarily, is, is abstractly defined as a transformation that leads the uh, solution to the equation of motion um, invariant, well, take the space of all kinematically possible trajectories um, through the state space of the theory, consider the subset there that consists of all the dynamically possible um, trajectories through the state space of the theory, uh, construct some smooth but other otherwise arbitrary permutation on that space of dynamically possible solutions, extend it smoothly but otherwise arbitrarily uh, to all of the um, kinematically possible solutions, and voila, a dynamical symmetry. And with really very limited constraints coming from differential topology, then this more or less allows you to say that any two states of affairs are symmetry related. And clearly we're not going to be able to get any very substantive interpretation work done from that. <clears throat> and yeah, that observation has been repeatedly made. Uh, Jan Isbell and Bas van Frassen make it with, with some force, for instance, um, and it looks compelling. You might think that that kind of thing is obviously a philosopher's toy. Nobody in, symmetry, in physics would bother calling that a symmetry. But there are other examples closer to just things that physicists take seriously that um, seem to open themselves up to similar objections. Gordon Bellert has a lovely paper going through examples of this um, to pick uh, one of those, which again came up briefly when I was responding to Dave. If I look at the central force problem of the motion of the Earth around the sun or the moon around the Earth, for instance, um, that theory has that, that theory obviously doesn't have translational symmetries. We've broken them by a choice of center. That's innocuous. It has time translation symmetry. That's fine. It has rotational symmetry. That's fine. It's great. We, we, all the sort of symmetry related epistemic and metaphysical good stuff looks fine for time translation symmetry. It looks fine for rotational symmetry. There's a thing called the lens ringer symmetry for which it does not look fine. Um, I won't bother giving the technical account of what this symmetry is, but it's a dynamical symmetry in the sense that it transforms solutions to solutions. Indeed, it's a Hamiltonian symmetry. It, it's actually a consequence of the specific form of the inverse square law. So you see rotational and time translational symmetry in any central force problem, but you only see the lens ringer symmetry when I've got an, an exact inverse square. Um, its transformations do things like leave the shape of orbits non invariant. So um, I can do a lens ringer transformation that takes an orbit that's elliptical to an orbit that's elliptical of a different um, elliptical shape. <laughs> and these are relatively clearly things that we don't want um, to be invariant under symmetry transformation. Sorry, that we don't want to come to the conclusion that we can't observe those differences, or that they're not physical differences at all, or that different shaped ellipses are just as suited to represent the motion of, of the Earth around the sun. You could say similar things about the conformal symmetry in the vacuum sector of electromagnetism. You know, the uh, vacuum EM has um, the Poincaré symmetries, that sounds fine, but it also has spatially dependent conformal symmetries. And those, again, don't look like the kind of thing where we want to say they're merely descriptions of underlying things that we can't detect what they are. OK, so <clears throat> what do we do in the face of, the, of the, these problems in the dynamical conception? Well, uh, one response is to say that this just demonstrates that this is not the, the link between the dynamical and the representational and, and, the, and these other features isn't good. So here are two authors with very different starting points who broadly reach this conclusion. Here's Gordon Bellert. The ways of encoding the content of laws that are most appealing to mathematicians and physicists appear to lead to notions of dynamical symmetry that are coolly indifferent to considerations of representational equivalence. <laughs> 
<coughs> and here's Shamit Dasgupta. The notion of symmetry is often defined in purely formal mathematical terms. So the whether a given transformation is a symmetry of a given set of laws depends just on the formal and mathematical features of those laws and their models. But why should those features of the laws have anything to do with metaphysics of what's real? It's not obvious. <coughs> And that might suggest moving to a, a different conception of symmetry, and that's a popular move in the literature. So here are the two main classes of alternative we see. On the epistemic conception of symmetry, which does go up to likes, which is Mellon and Faustin like, a symmetry is definitionally, whatever else it might be, a transformation which leaves observable features of a theory invariant. So typically, typically I should say all of these definitions are dynamical symmetry plus, as in it's usually at least necessary that the transformation takes solutions to solutions. But on top of that, we add something else. So on the epistemic conception, we add the idea that a symmetry le leaves the unobservable features, sorry, the observable features of the theory invariant. <coughs> on the representational conception, a symmetry is inter alia, a transformation that leaves the representational features of a theory invariant. Um, usually it does that by being an automorphism of the underlying mathematics. <coughs> so if anyone who's um, familiar with the sort of classic space-time tradition of Ehrman and Friedman, as written up in particular in Ehrman's um, wonderful world, world enough in space-time, will know that Ehrman's conception of an dynamical symmetry is basically what I give, but his concept of space-time symmetry is a diffeomorphism that preserves the absolute structures um, of the space-time, uh, leaves the, and then uh, generalizing that outside the space-time context, that's to say it's an automorphism of the underlying mathematical structures. Okay, those alternatives uh, philosophically have a lot going for them. I don't like them, even so, um, for two reasons, basically. The first problem is I think they're boring. <clears throat> the symmetry seemed to offer a golden promise. It seemed to be able to let us make some substantive interpretational um, conclusions about the epistemology of the theory, about the representational functioning of the theory from the existence of symmetry. And the problem from that perspective with these alternatives is they kind of build in the answer. <clears throat> so if a symmetry definitionally leaves observable features of a theory invariant, then yes, there is an inference from such and such is variant under the action of the symmetry to um, uh, such and such is unobservable. It's short, easy, analytic and uninformative. <clears throat> I might say that about anything analytic, but this is clearly one of the uninformative ones, even though they're um, broader cases. Similarly, if one's really interested in the idea of when symmetry related situations are representationally equivalent, um, then it's going to be immediate that that's the case if I build the notion of representational equivalence into my theory. Uh, but it's equally going to be rather uninteresting. So, you know, the ambitious hope would be to be able to hold on to some notion of symmetry, whereby these inferences carried on being contentful, where the discovery of symmetry allowed us then to make some further inference about epistemology or representational capacity or both, rather than that inference just being part of establishing whether there was a symmetry in the first place. <laughs> the second concern, and perhaps this is the more serious one, is that there's, a <clears throat> there's an issue of naturalism here. If, as is my take on these things, at least one starting point here wants to be something like physics as we find it as our guide to um, to uh, how we might think about the structure of the world, if, if one doesn't want to come in with too many a priori conceptions put on top of physics, then one needs to worry about the idea that these alternative definitions of symmetry aren't necessarily a good fit to um, scientific practice, to physics practice in particular. And seeing if I had a quote about this, I didn't we'll come back, I'll just paraphrase. Um, so if you think about the epistemic conception, for instance, um, Symmetries in, say, modern quantum field theory are discovered in a very formal technical sense in regimes which are extremely distant from any consideration of what's epistemically detectable. Um, it's a little subtle on the representational conception of symmetries, but um, uh, no less true for that. So while we're used in uh, the mathematical corners of philosophy of physics, to the beauty of the differential geometry and to the formulation of theories like gauge theories or space-time theories in a um, mathematical language that tends to make the symmetries indeed be automorphisms of mathematical structure. Generally speaking, that's not the format we originally come across the theory in. And it's usually hard work to discover how to move to the sort of more geometric description of the theory. And our guide to doing so is normally the symmetries. <clears throat> 
So a uh, famous example everyone in philosophy of physics knows is the elimination of absolute space, uh, our original mathematical structure for space and time certainly is not invariant under uh, boost shifts. We wanted it to be invariant under boost shifts, so we reformulate it. Why did we want it to be invariant under boost shifts? Because boost shifts were of symmetry. That reasoning doesn't make sense, except insofar as we have some concept of what a symmetry is that doesn't build in the representational interpretation. A, a slightly less well-known example, um, if you think about electromagnetic gauge theory, uh, the sort of modern fancy way of formulating electromagnetic gauge theory is that an electromagnetic gauge is a connection on a U1 bundle. Uh, the gauge transformations there are automorphisms. It's all very beautiful. But of course, the way the theory was initially formulated was a, a, um, a gauge potential is a four vector. Uh, and four vectors have tons of gauge non invariant properties. If I want to say this four vector has divergence zero, the property of having divergence zero is emphatically not gauge invariant. Uh, why did we move from the four vector formulation to a more austere formulation? Uh, because on the four vector formulation, the symmetries were not automorphisms. We wanted them to be, we had a substantive dynamical conception of symmetry and wanted to map that across <coughs> um, to the automorphisms. So for these reasons, I badly don't want to give up on the notion of a symmetry as um, uh, as a dynamical concept of theory, um, which means I'm interested in trying to see what's the answer to that set of severe problems for the dynamical concept that we came up with previously. Um, and that means, um, in part, that simply means finding a criterion for which, um, which, which dynamical symmetries are the ones that permit epistemic uh, metaphysical modal inferences. Um, but I don't think it's a good idea just to play that in the sort of the the definition and counterexample game that we do in philosophy. I, I don't think we just want to look for a self-consistent definition such that it gets all the intuitive um, plausible cases right. I think we want some understanding of why it is <coughs> that dynamically, um, the dynamical symmetry have the inferences they have. Um, and that understanding of itself to tell us in which cases it works and which dynamical symmetries don't in fact lead to these consequences. Now, I'm going to focus here on the, um, the epistemic conception here, I'm, um, partly for reasons of time. I'm mostly interested in the case of when it is that a symmetry transformation um, is unobservable or that symmetry-related situations can't be distinguished. And here's the basic components of the account that I um, want to be running with. And the first is something that came up in the response to Dave Baker, and Dave correctly identified this as the place in which his and my, in many respects, quite similar views come apart. Um, the first thing I want to be assuming is that our physical theories, or at least most of our physical theories, are in the business not of modeling the universe, but of modeling subsystems of a larger system and modeling them under the idealization that they're isolated. Um, so, so Dave said um, in the just in the last talk that. Um, uh, you know, what, what we're doing in physics, at least these days, is not working with fundamental theories. Um, uh, we're working with theories that are most approximately true in some regimes. And so there's a methodological question about how to do philosophy of physics, given that situation. And Dave was advocating a strategy of um, uh, operate under the fiction that the theory is exactly true, work out what you should think then, and then make inferences from that, what we should actually think. Um, and I want to separate that into two parts. I'm not a fan of that in various respects, but I think, I, but I think for these purposes in, in particular, there are two aspects of that sort of pretend the theory is exact that can be brought apart to some extent. I'm going to put aside the question about how whether we should pretend the theory is exact in the sense that we should pretend you know it applies on all scales, it doesn't go wrong for sufficiently high energies, all this kind of stuff. I'm more interested in the idea that we should pretend the theory is exact in the sense that we should pretend it describes the entire universe. That cosmological assumption is a really common model um, move in philosophy of physics, but I don't think it's anything very close to what we're doing most of the time in physics. The overwhelming majority of models we consider in physics are not intended as models of the universe. They're intended as models of little bits of the universe. If you think, just look at the models we run into, look at the Earth-Moon system, uh, look at scattering of particles off one another, look at the one particle sector of a quantum field theory, uh, look at simple harmonic oscillators, or just sit back and ask yourself how physics could ever be in the business of saying what we're doing is building theories and comparing them to the data, if that was always about building a theory of the entire universe. Um, it looks really very clear from physics practice and just from common sense 
that what we're doing with the overwhelming majority of these theories is taking little chunks of the universe, trying to model those little chunks, hoping we can get away with idealizing the rest of the stuff out of infinity. And I want to take that as an interpretive starting point. I want to say what it is to understand the content of physical theory, and so in particular to understand how to think about the symmetries of that physical theory, is to understand them in the concept that the theory is a subsystem of a larger universe. That's step one. <clears throat> step two, um, generally speaking, what we're doing in modeling measurement of some quantity, observation of some quantity in a model, is we're trying to understand how that model couples dynamically to another model. So it is possible to do physics in rich enough situations they can model their own measurement theory, but it's fairly unusual. Uh, our modelings of the Earth-Moon system don't typically model the devices we use to detect um, the motion of the Earth. Our uh, modelling of particle physics doesn't normally include the detector. Our modelling of gravity waves doesn't normally detect, in, include the detector of gravity waves. Indeed, in many of these cases, it can't include it. Um, it's an interesting aspect of, say, gravity wave astronomy, that the physics of the machinery that detects gravity waves is almost entirely disjoint from the um, the physics of the gravity waves itself. Gravity waves are a classical device, a classical um, phenomenon in vacuum general relativity. Gravity wave detectors are extremely complicated quantum mechanical gadgets. Um, the measurement is being done by some system external to the system we're studying, and it might not even be governed by the same detailed physical laws. <clears throat> and this incidentally and crucially is the place at which one begins to tease open that question of how a formal property like a symmetry could have implications for an epistemic property, which is the measurement of physical processes nonetheless. Um, and the requirement that my measurement is not kind of divine appreciation of the truth that actually requires some kind of gadget that responds differentially to stuff um, is a lever in which you, into which you can kind of, sorry, a, a crack into which you insert a lever um, and fries open some space to be able to get a, um, to build a connection between dynamics and epistemology and then up to metaphysics and modernity. But crucially, for that to work, the symmetry can't just be a symmetry of the system being measured. It has to extend to the combined physics of the system being measured and the system doing the measuring and their coupling. In other words, if I think that generally speaking measurement involves dynamical intervention on my system with another system, then the dynamical systems of symmetries of the first system in isolation can't in themselves tell you anything about the measurement theory, because ex hypothesis, the system is no longer in isolation, it's coupled to something else, and I need to consider the interaction. And so to get constraints on our epistemology from the dynamical symmetries of a system, we have to make some further assumption about whether that symmetry extends to a larger system that includes the measurement difference. <laughs> So let me cash out some possibilities there. Suppose we take a physical system and we couple it to another physical system. What happens to its symmetries? Well, <clears throat> here are three possibilities. The first possibility is that the symmetry of the subsystem is subsystem specific. It doesn't extend to the combined system at all. So for instance, the Lenz-Ringer symmetry of the central force problem is a specific symmetry to the central force problem. There's no extension of that symmetry out to some optical device that actually looks at how far away the moon is, say. Likewise, the conformal symmetry of vacuum electromagnetism is a symmetry of vacuum electromagnetism, the truth the clues in the name. Bring in charged matter, couple it, and vacuum electromagnetism is linear, so bring in charged matter is basically an option. Now the conformal symmetry in general ceases to be a symmetry. Claim, if I've got a subsystem specific symmetry, there are no implications for observability because there's no, um, <clears throat> no route by which I can um, make any inference from the symmetry to how the measurement process occurs because the very fact of making the measurement makes the symmetry cease to apply. And that's a good conclusion, of course, because um, we didn't want these symmetries to um, tell us what was unobservable because they manifestly fail at that. And so we have got a diagnosis of why they fail at that. They fail at that because they're not extendable to broader systems than include measurement devices. <laughs> Second possibility is that the symmetry does extend and it extends in what I call a subsystem global way, which is to say that I can, and I, and I should say for, for, throughout this talk, for reasons of space, I'm going to be a bit loose on technical notions that are rather sharper in the papers on which this talk is based. 
But um, in the subsystem global case, the idea is that the symmetry does extend to the combined system, and it extends in such a way that to apply the symmetry, I need to do a non-trivial transformation of system and measurement device simultaneously. <coughs> <coughs> so for instance, in particle non relativistic particle mechanics, if I consider coupling some collection of particles to some other collection of particles via some appropriate force, then uh, provide the whole system is appropriately well behaved and it's on Galilean space time, etc., then the symmetry of the subsystem, it, you know, let it be boosts, for instance, extends to a boost symmetry of the combined system, but it does so on the requirement you have to boost the measurement device too. You know, I've got um, I've got a bunch of particles and a device that measures how fast they're going. Uh, I could take that combined system and apply a boost, and it's still a symmetry of the combined system, but I need to boost the measurement device too. <laughs> As a subtle example, the uh, in gauge theory, then the gauge transformations that preserve the boundary, um, but but an unvanishing of the boundary are subsystem global. I can talk more about that in the questions if people are interested. If I've got a subsystem global symmetry, um, and here I'm not suggesting this is immediate, this is a relatively straightforward proof, it is possible to measure a quantity variant under a subsystem global symmetry. So for instance, it is perfectly possible in the dynamical coupling sense to measure how fast a particle is going or where the particle is or how rapidly a system is rotating, uh, measure in the sense that I can couple that system to another system such that uh, different values of the variant property on the measured system co um, correspond to different outcomes of the measuring system. However, in those situations, it is always possible to reinterpret that process is the measurement of some symmetry invariant relation between subsystem and measurement device. So velocity boosts are a dynamical symmetry. Um, if my car is on the highway, it is possible to measure its speed in the sense that I can correlate its speed to some, uh, to the invariant properties of some measurement device in the sense that uh, were my car moving faster than it is, then the measurement device would, would record um, a different number, but it would always be possible to reinterpret that same physical process, not as a measurement of a property of the system, but as a measurement of a relation between the system and the measuring device. So I could certainly interpret my speedometer as measuring the speed of my car, but I can equally well interpret it as measuring the relative speed of my car on the road. There's a certain kind of metaphysical take where I'd say, well, that the more fundamental property is the relative speed. I'm kind of nervous about that because, again, I don't like the idea of having to interpret my theories in the first instance as theories of the universe. I want to understand what the properties are of my system. Um, and among those properties are extrinsic properties, like how fast is it going? But that's still a property, my isolated system, and it's a measurable property. But combine the system with another system, and now <laughs> that it, those extrinsic properties kind of pair up and can be understood as characterizing relations between the two subsystems in the larger system, <laughs> and so on. Third possibility, the symmetry might be subsystem local, which is to say it does extend to the combined system, but the extension is trivial on the new system. Uh, in other words, there's a symmetry of the combined system plus measurement device, but what that symmetry does to the measurement device is leave it alone. Permutation symmetry in particle mechanics is an elementary example of this. If I've got six particles and have the same masses and charges and whatever, there's a permutation sy symmetry of those particles. If I bring in some more particles, then there's a permutation symmetry of that larger group of particles, which consists of leaving the new particles alone and just permuting the old particles. So I can extend the permutation symmetry from the subsystem to a bigger system, and the big, the rest of the new, the new bit of the system just doesn't change. Uh, you know. Again, the quick comment for those um, with interest in this area, asymptotically trivial gauge transformations have that property as well. You can't measure quantities in variant under, that are variant under a subsystem local symmetry. You can't measure them even in the sense that you can measure the subsystem global um, parameters. You can't measure them at all. There's a subtlety that I'll touch on only briefly, which is in some cases, they get empirical significance indirectly by comparison of the earlier states of the same system. So for instance, there's some empirical significance in the permutation symmetry because you can ask were the particles permuted relative to where they were earlier or not. You know, if I have if I have some uh, some earlier set of particles and they evolved to some later set of particles, you can ask well 
how does that dynamics differ from what I get if I wanted to evolve to the permuted set of particles? Um, so there are interesting indirect ways that could apply, but I'll mostly leave that out for reasons of space. Okay, so that's a framework. Let me now return. I've had about 20 minutes, is that right, 25? You should be about finishing now. Uh, okay, I had less time. In that case, there'll be rather less on the isolated systems and symmetries. I had less time than I realized I did. I thought we started at, um, we were going to start at 10 past, we actually started at quarter past. And I thought we had 30, 35 minutes. Oh, well, I'll take another five minutes. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so does that give us the prospect of having interpretive results from formal assumptions? We came in saying that's not possible. Well, it is. we can see here it is possible <clears throat> in the sense that um, uh, what, what makes it possible um, is that we have to make assumptions about how symmetry extends from one system to a larger system. And that's not an assumption, that's not a purely formal property of the subsystem symmetries. It's not some, it's, it's something bringing in something extra interpretive. And I, the, the, the thing I want to sort of finish on briefly is the idea that actually there's a, there's a broader way in which there's still something formal about a system that can tell us something about the extension of a system symmetry to larger systems, that tell us something defeasibly about it. And that extra thing is that many physical theories we study in physics, including most of those that we slightly complicatedly call fundamental theories, whether that means like Newtonian gravity or field theory or whatever, um, but not sort of two-body problems or simple harmonic oscillators, many such theories have a property I call subsystem recursivity. And what I mean by that is a theory is subsystem recursive if given a certain model of the theory <clears throat> and given an in-practice isolated subsystem of the given model in, in some sector of the theory, some particular choice of how to use the theory to model a particular situation, then that in-practice isolated subsystem could be represented in idealization by another sector of the same theory. Um, it's easier to illustrate this than to try to give an abstract definition. Suppose I've got a particle theory um, and suppose it's, I'm considering uh, a 30 particle um, system and they're all interacting under gravity, <clears throat> but 10 of the particles are miles away over here and the other 20 are miles away over there. So now the interaction between these 10 particles and the 20 particles can be largely neglected. Um, these 10 particles are in practice isolated from the other 10, 20 particles. And there's another model of Newtonian gravity, a 10 particle model of Newtonian gravity, which pretty much models those 10 particles by themselves. The physics of this in practice isolated subsystem can be represented in the 30 particle sector, can be represented in, in idealization by the 10 particle sector. <clears throat> and conversely, we can understand any sector as an idealized representation of an isolated subsystem of a different model. So those 30 particles can be understood as, an in as, as 30 in practice isolated particles in a 100 particle system, where I've got the 10 particles over here, the 20, part the 20 particles over here, and the other 70 particles way over there at the door. And this kind of subsystem recursivity means, this is very much linked to the idea we should never think of our models as modeling the whole universe, says something like any given model we have can be thought of as an isolated subsystem of a larger model. And for any given model we have, if in fact it breaks down into isolated subsystems, we can think of those as other models. And that gives us some machinery by which we can try to work out what the symmetry extension rules are of a theory. So if you want to know, for instance, in Newtonian gravity, can I extend, I've got a model of Newtonian gravity, can I extend its symmetries and how does that play out? Well, I can understand that. I think that my model of Newtonian gravity ought to be understandable as a model of a subsystem of a larger model of Newtonian gravity. And then that gives me the resources to say, well, how do the symmetries extend? So the recipe is something like this. You check the extendability of the symmetries of the isolated proper subsystems within the sector. You idealize those proper subsystems as other sectors of the theory, and then you read off the interpretation of those sector symmetries, and you iterate. Uh, I won't give case studies, but just to give people, just for time reasons, but just to give people the idea, if you play this game in, you can play this game in non-relativistic particle mechanics. It returns the idea that the space-time symmetries are subsystem global. Uh, but and the, the permutation symmetries are, I've written subsystem, uh, I've written this the wrong way around, actually the permutation symmetries are subsystem local. So those claims I made in the um, earlier part of the talk about how space, time and permutation symmetries work are something we can actually establish once we realize that we can think of isolated subsystems as subsystems of larger isolated subsystems. <clears throat> 
Um, and we can play similar games with field theoretic cases. Um, I, I, um, and I, I'm happy to discuss any of those in the, the questions, but the broad shape plays out similarly. We can take a field theory, we can take isolated sectors of the field theory, we can look at how those symmetries extend out from the isolated sectors, and we can use that to make inferences um, about which quantities are observable within the subsectors. Okay, I think I'm probably out of time at this point, so why don't I end there and leave any of the various loose ends to things we can perhaps talk about in the questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, so as I understood, you mean that uh, subsystem equacivity found uh, the result of your observability paper? I'm sorry, Valeria, is that a question? I didn't... Uh, yeah, yeah, it was just uh, before I, <laughs> I get to my response, I was just trying to summarize the end of your talk. Uh, uh, do you mean that uh, subsystem equacivity from the two-part paper uh, uh, it provides a foundation to the uh, results of your observability paper? I'll just put the papers up here instantly for people correct. Uh, yeah. yeah. The notion of subsystem recursivity is something I discuss in papers two and three on this list, um, which sort of take as read the analysis uh, of, of part one. <clears throat> mm -hmm. uh, okay, but so I call two and three, I call the two part paper and, and one I call observability paper. Okay, yeah. so, <laughs> uh, so thank you for the presentation. Uh, I will uh, make a response until uh, my 19 and then we'll see. <clears throat> uh, so, um, uh, there was a part of your talk uh, about which I will not uh, tell anything now because <laughs> it will go into my, I, I will return to it in my own talk. Okay, so this is the part about um, <clears throat> whether we should uh, prefer the um, epistemic definition of symmetry or we should use formal features to derive something <clears throat> ontological. Okay, so I will uh, just leave it <clears throat> for a while. Uh, I would like to discuss uh, what I have not sent you, but uh, which is relevant to your talk. Okay, so uh, you propose in the observability paper um, this classification, uh, this division into um, subsystem, uh, specific subsystem global and subsystem local uh, symmetries. Okay, uh, yeah. Um, so, uh, and uh, you, uh, uh, your idea is that this classification, which is supposed to be formal, uh, uh, allows to infer something about observability. Okay, uh, uh, for me, this, there is a methodological uh, error here because uh, for me, it looks like this uh, three part classification is itself. Uh, actually about observation. So it looks like you are trying to derive something about observation from something which is actually also about observation. And so instead of, uh, you are explaining uh, by a second thing, by a first, which is actually of the same kind and which is itself is actually in need of explanation. So now I will try to briefly explain why, uh, how it happens. Okay. so. Uh, beforehand, you have this Gibbs and Wallace paper of 2014, and there you are speaking about uh, uh, direct empirical status versus its absence. Okay, so uh, a usual Newtonian symmetry uh, is where you transform the whole universe. You boost it, for instance, and uh, um, and and you do not. Um, and for you, this uh, generates a, a universal sym well, a symmetry of the universe. Yeah, I call it a universal symmetry. Okay, so for you, the boost of the whole universe is a universal symmetry, but uh, the boost of a subsystem uh, alone is uh, not a universal symmetry uh, because it generates um, changes which we can observe uh, uh, if we boost a ship. We observe it from the shore and so on. Uh, okay. So your conceptualization of these examples is in terms of uh, the universal symmetry is present versus universal symmetry is absent, okay? But the same uh, distinction can actually be formulated in terms of, uh, in observational terms, 
because uh, what does it mean to have a symmetry of the whole universe? It means that all, all the predictions are preserved. That's what I call observationally complete symmetry, or you can call it unobservable in your terms. Uh, and uh, when you have direct empirical status, when you boost just a ship, uh, what does it mean that uh, in your terms you don't have a universal symmetry? Well, it just means that you you uh, not all predictions are preserved. So I call it up observationally incomplete. You would call it observable in the observability paper. Okay. So your distinction between universal uh, the presence versus absence of universal symmetry can be reformulated as, as a distinction between uh, universal symmetry, which is observationally complete, uh, versus universal symmetry, which is which is observationally incomplete. Okay, so this was about Gris and Wallace paper, but uh, the same applies to the observability paper. So, uh, so you have, um, you start by saying that uh, when, when the subsystem is considered by itself, uh, uh, there is no um, way you can, uh, detect uh, the change of the subsystem, but it's uh, not, uh, you are again making the same move as uh, when you were saying that uh, if uh, if uh, not all predictions of, on the universe are preserved, then the symmetry is absent. Uh, but if we formulate in the previous terms, which I proposed, okay, so uh, there is a solution. Take uh, within your subsystem, which is alone, you do not add any other subsystem, okay? So this is uh, the fourth section of your observability paper, uh, subsystem considered alone. Uh, if we transform this whole subsystem, of course, there is nothing uh, external with respect to which this transformation will be observed. But if you divide uh, your subsystem into parts and you transform one part with respect to another, then you generate a change of <laughs> observable change of this part with respect to uh, the rest. So within your uh, subsystem, you can have changes by transforming one part with respect to the other. Uh, and you will say, uh, well, this is a failure of a symmetry. <laughs> but I will say it's just it's just observability. It's just uh, observational incompleteness. Okay, and uh, now we get to your uh, case where uh, what you call measurement, <laughs> uh, where to this first subsystem is added a second. Okay, and then there you have three cases. So it's uh, either the symmetry of the first thing is un unextendable to the symmetry of first plus second, or it's extendable when both are transformed alike, or it's extendable when. Uh, one is transformed uh, non trivially and the other trivially. So these are subsystem uh, <clears throat> specific uh, global and local cases. Okay. So uh, again, uh, what does it mean that the symmetry is, uh, is extensible? Well, it means that you transform uh, both in some way and predictions all are unchanged. So this is uh, like uh, what I was calling uh, observationally complete, or, or this is what in the Greaves and Wallace paper you were calling uh, universal symmetry. Mm, so, uh, but what does it mean if uh, if uh, your subsystem global symmetry is observable? Well, it means it does not preserve all predictions. Okay, so these are notions of the same kind. Uh, the subsystem globality is the preservation of predictions on the whole uh, joint system. And the, uh, observe, uh, the fact that the subsystem global symmetry is observable is the non-preservation. So these are notions of the same kind. They are opposite because uh, one is observational completeness, another observational incompleteness, but they are... Uh, they are both observational notions. Subsystem globality is observational because it, it actually means uh, the uh, preservation of all predictions. And uh, what you try to infer from subsystem globality, what you call observability, it's also an observational notion because it's a non-preservation of predictions. So uh, I'm repeating again, uh, the upshot is you are, you are like pretending that subsystem globality is uh, formal and distinct from what you want to infer from it. But actually, the two notions are like they are both uh, observational notions if you reformulate them in my terms. And uh, it, it, it seems to be a methodological error to, um, to try to explain uh, one thing by another thing of the same kind. Uh, what we need is an explanation uh, where uh, the cause is different from uh, what we are trying to explain. It should be different in nature. Uh, okay, so, uh, and it, it's in, in any 
case, it's not uh, what you wanted if you wanted to derive an observational explanation from a formal feature. If I'm right that subsystem globality is not a formal feature, then even if we suppose that subsystem globality explains observa observation, uh, well, uh, observability of subsystem global synthesis, then uh, uh, you would still be explaining one non-formal notion by another, uh, also not formal. Um, so I have uh, many other remarks, uh, but uh, um, let, let's let's discuss this one. Great, thank you for those comments. Um, you'll be unsurprised to hear I don't agree that there's a methodological error in the argument. Um, I think what's going on in what you're saying is that there's a point where you're deciding to reinterpret my use of the word symmetry according to your own preferred definition, which is which is epistemic. And if I was doing that, then I agree that the whole argument would be question begging, but that's not what I mean by symmetry. So I mean systematically through um, these, th this collection of, of papers, symmetry is, a dyna is dynamical symmetry. So when you say what it means for uh, as, uh, the transformation subsystem global is that the transformation leaves all the predictions unchanged on the larger system. You can use the word symmetry that way if you want. That's the observational conception of symmetry I discussed, but that's simply not how, not how I'm using the word symmetry. The question of whether the symmetry is extendable here is a purely formal question about the combined system. I have system plus measurement device. They have a dynamics, which is let to be classical for definiteness, has a self a Hamiltonian that, that, that is the sum of a self Hamiltonian for system, a self Hamiltonian for measurement device and a coupling term. Um, and uh, I had a transformation which, in the absence of the coupling term, commuted with the action of the self Hamiltonian. And I want to know whether there is some extension of that trans transformation to be a transformation on the state space of the combined system, such that the action of that transformation commutes with evolution under the, the coupled Hamiltonian. This is an entirely formal notion. <clears throat> there's, no, there's no space in that. Um, to require that observation is definitional. We, we can debate what, or is, what is or is not achieved, not derived from that formal notion, but it doesn't contain any, um, any use of the notion of observation. So I just want to deny that the Lee's predictions un, unchanged has anything to do with what I mean by subsystem global. And I think the paper's clear on that. And um, the other thing I'd say, which goes back right back to the um the Marxism made at the beginning is that uh, it's not quite true that I think extendability, notwithstanding what I've just said, that I think extendability is a formal notion. Given an actual extension of a system to include a measurement device, it's a formal notion of whether the symmetry extends. But of course, it's not a formal notion <clears throat> of system of it's not it's not formally de derivable from the system by itself as a sort of fixed model. Um, whether it's symmetry extends or does not extend to some larger system. Um, I mean, I've said that there's a surrogate of that you can get in subsystem recursive theories, but it's never going to be a formal property simply of set of the theory. And, and this, is, this is a broader comment. Um, it's it's good that that's the case, because of course, there needs to be a certain empirical component as to whether we can detect symmetry transformations or not. I mean, uh, if you take, say, um, Newtonian, uh, sort of Newtonian mechanical system, um, is it, um, uh, yeah, that, that, that theory has reflections, spatial reflection, parity, as a dynamical symmetry. Is that symmetry extendable to any device that measures it? As it happens, no, because my device might use the electroweak field, um, and actually electroweak physics doesn't have parity symmetries. So actually, um, it's not true um, that uh, parity is guaranteed to be unobservable in Newtonian models. <laughs> Perfectly possible as it happens, to determine that um, you know the Earth is rotating around the Sun in the uh, preferred direction of rotation established by the you know, differential decay roots of um, I don't know, W bosons, um, but of course that's not something one could ever have learned from inside Newtonian mechanics. So it's it's not formal and it's properly not formal. <laughs> the, the other thing I was saying I'll say briefly just since, since you mentioned um, uh, my joint paper with Hilary from about ten years ago, um, but that paper again is not using uh, observation is its definition of a symmetry. That, that paper treats symmetry as primitive and it, and it, it makes a substantial thesis. It, it, it assumes that it's established that you can, that symmetry related situations are unobservable, but it, that's not the definition of what symmetries are there. That paper doesn't engage with the definitions. It just starts with that assumption for global systems and 
ask what can we do I for local systems. That said, it is true that paper starts with a notion of universal symmetries and tries to specialise the subsystems. I think that's a deficiency of the paper and it's one that um, I've hoped to remedy in the more recent work. Okay, that's probably all I've got in response. Yeah, thank you. I, I'm sure you wanted uh, a subsystem globality not to be observational, but... Uh, well, I want it. It's just it's mathematically true that it's not. It's three lines uh, back. Yeah, but uh, the fact that you preserve equations, equations uh, entail <laughs> predictions and so on. Huh? <clears throat> well, sure, indirectly and interpretively, but those, th those entailments are not reliably formal features. What I care about is the equation. Those are, that's the formal level of the theory. Yeah, but all your examples are such that uh, when subsystem, uh, when the symmetry is subsystem global, so when you transform a boss <coughs> uh, subsystem and uh, the measurement apparatus alike, uh, uh, they are unobservable. So your typical examples are boost and so on. They, uh, even if uh, like formally the unobservability is not built in, effectively it's uh, uh, there in uh, your examples. So I'm not going to respond because I think there's a procedural issue here. Um, I think probably it would be sensible for you either to move us into the question session and chair that, or if you think that uh, the speaker and, and respondent should keep, you should probably relinquish the chair to somebody else. Uh, no, uh, uh, let's uh, continue with other questions uh, and uh, I will return to my ideas in uh, my talk. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, so everybody okay. else... Yeah, if you have questions, uh, uh, raise your hand. Uh, or if not, David, <laughs> uh, uh, why are you always uh, only thinking about transforming subsystem and not about uh, the environment, uh, not about transforming the environment independently? Oh, environment system as a subsystem. If you want to extend it to that, you're welcome. But system plus some environment still isn't the universe. That's still a subsystem, which we should think about in the context of its embedding in larger systems. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I, uh, independently of what uh, was the result is the universe or not. I mean, uh, you are uh, uh, you are concentrating on transforming one subsystem, and then you add another. But how about transforming both of them independently and asking what the yield? Um, well, if you want to, if, if you if, if you think you can do that and get some interesting interpretive consequences out of it, then go for it. That sounds an interesting project. The project uh, I'm interested in is saying I've got a system. The system has some dynamical symmetries. I would like to know what interpretive consequence we can draw for the interpretation of the system and for the epistemology of the system and for the modal content of the system from those symmetries. Um, those that's a, that's a question of inferring properties of system X from things system X does. Um, there are then separate relational things we might want to try um, about how the systems relate to other systems. And you know, the symmetry is a rich subject with lots of interesting things we can investigate. Uh, yeah, yeah, so, uh, example, uh, take your subsystem local symmetry. You say that it's unobservable. Yeah, so it's a symmetry which uh, uh, you apply on the subsystem and then the, the other subsystem is uh, uh, transformed by identity. And you are saying that uh, in that case, there is no uh, way to get observability. But, Mm. Suppose you have a subsystem global symmetry, but you transform the environment non trivially. Then there will be a difference. There will be observability arising because you transform the environment. You boost the environment, but not the subsystem. Yeah. So there's a methodological point here. I mean, if, uh, if I establish a theorem that says in such and such a situation something can't be. Um, uh can't be observed then if you think that's wrong i need to know why the why the theorem is wrong i mean one can't simply decide to think of new clever transformations it may be the case that a given transformation is blocked but um, the whole point about proving theorems is one doesn't then have to engage with each of the individual cases yeah i, I have this theory it's uh, to say that subsystem global subsystem local uh, case the observability in both cases is actually the same thing the is the same if you transform the subsystem and you keep, uh, if you boost uh, the ship, you keep invariant the shore, you get observability of uh, subsystem global symmetry. But if uh, you, if the ship is uh, transformation is identity, this is a subsystem local symmetry. But yeah. you boost the environment, you still get the observability. Why? Because it does not matter where is the environment, where is the subsystem, it's just sufficient that one of them be transformed. 
Uh, this shows that subsystem global and subsystem local symmetries are equally observable. I don't think I've got anything to say. I didn't say already in my previous responses. I think it's a question from John. Uh, okay, uh, John. Um, yeah, thanks. This is, I mean, partially just to, to make sure I understand the proposal. But so for, an, yeah. I mean, so the, you know, the problems that were raised at the beginning of the dynamical uh, mm -hmm. approach to it, one of these was there's clear counterexamples. And some of these were sort of goofy ones, just, you know, scramble things smoothly. And some of them were a little bit more physical. And I think I understand in the physical cases how substance and recursivity is going to solve it. You know, mm -hmm. in the uh, lens run case, you're just going to look at two solar systems. You're going to look at whatever you're using to observe the two body problem and then say, ah, well, that's going to get me the sort of uh, eccentricity or whatever that I need. Mm -hmm. um, just because I, I can't see it clearly enough formally, is this also going to, is substance system recursivity going to get you around the sort of smooth scrambling silly examples? Or is yeah, that going to be I, believe, by the I, I believe so, but it's slightly subtler to establish. So the, 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 okay. the scrambling silly examples are in general time dependent symmetries. Mm. Uh, and applying the analysis for time dependent symmetries is a bit more delicate because I can't, you know, I can't just think of the symmetry as a, a transformation on a, a state space that commutes the dynamics anymore. I've got some kind of indexing going. Um, I believe that you could embed the silly examples in that framework. And I go through that framework in the first of the three papers in the list here. But I'll confess that I don't have at my fingertips exactly how that's specifically going to work here. I mean, I think the answer is going to be something like this, that, um, well, actually, I suppose here's a, here's a, here's a, a minimal version of it, think you loud. Um, <clears throat> the, very, the very idea of defining the symmetry as a permutation of the whole history space is going to make the, the concept, even the concept of extending it to a larger system when there's interactions quite difficult to pin down. So it's one, if you think about what extension means for a time independent symmetry, then I'm just saying, okay, I've got a permutation of the state space of the system. Well, is there some permute which commutes with the isolated system dynamics? Can I find a permutation of the state space of, of you know, the tensor state space of the system plus measurement device, which restricts to a permute to that original permutation and which commutes the dynamics? So if I've already got, if, if I'm if I'm working at the space of whole system histories, it's going to be somewhat subtler even to make that well defined in surprise it can't be defined at all that sort of grist to my mill the symmetry is like trivially and extendable because I just can't make sense of it right. in surprise it can be defined I think although it would be good to check the details that it's going to fall under that general story about time uh time dependent symmetries that I tell in the paper but I'm going to make the unsatisfactory move of saying I have to go back and remind myself of how those technical details go Sure, sure, but no, that's um, it's at least satisfying for you. And <laughs> you're absolutely right that in the circle had better close there, otherwise, it's obviously a hole in the argument. <laughs> okay, uh, we have a question by Christian. Okay, uh, can you hear me right? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. okay, uh, many thanks, David, for the talk. We're really, really interesting. It's a very, probably a very silly question, but some people sometimes distinguish between symmetry of models and symmetry of laws. Now, I, I want to understand if your notion of dynamical symmetry tries to identify well, this distinction or try to replace them by a different distinction. I, I, I couldn't see if you are, I yeah. mean, in which side you are. Yeah, so I'm eliding some details um, and they're, they're cached out in detail in the second and third of the papers in this series. I mean, so, I, I mean, actually, there's several things you could mean. So let me have a stab at it and see where we get to. So I have, I have in mind something like I have, I have, a, the, I have a theory um, and then I have sectors of that theory and sectors of the theories are the right things to model specific systems in the world. So again, it's easier to illustrate than to be specific about it. So my, my theory might be just Newtonian, Newtonian gravitational physics, any number of particles, any boundary conditions, whatever. Um, and my particular sector of the theory might be specified by a fixed number of particles and a fixed boundary conditions. So a um, mm -hmm. particular sector of the theory might have two particles and asymptotically flat boundary conditions and be good for describing the Earth-Moon system or the Earth-Sun system or something. In fact, you might want to say that a sector of the theory even specifies what, mass, <coughs> excuse me, what the masses are. <laughs> Similarly, in field theory, you might say that my theory is just given by the field equations, um, but my sector of the theory also requires boundary conditions. Um, so I think symmetries get defined in the first instance as symmetries of the theory. They leave the equations of motion of the theory invariant.
But then if you ask, is the symmetry of the theory a symmetry of the sector of the theory? Well, only if it preserves the conditions that define the sector. So if it leaves the boundary conditions invariant in practice, um, I suppose in theory, if it changes the number of particles, but that's not really going to happen. Um, <clears throat> and so in general, we're not going to get empirical consequences in a direct empirical significant sense unless we're looking at symmetries of the of the sector um, and not just of the whole theory. But even though I look at the symmetry of the sector, I'm still looking at symmetries of the dynamics um, and you want to distinguish that from symmetries of individual models in the sector so that i'm that, that i'm not considering so i'm not considering mm. if for instance i've got the earth moon system and i rotate it around the line between earth and moon that's a symmetry and not just of the dynamics but of the specific model um that's not really something i'm engaging in this this set of work um uh so i mean that obviously has interesting consequences with sort of situations of symmetry breaking and things but that's a, a somewhat separate set of issues so i think the answer to your question is i mostly talk about symmetries of laws um but i'm not um i'm not 100 percent sure exactly what it was you're cons you're thinking of so that's why i've gone into a bit of detail about that <laughs> yeah um <clears throat> um Valeria, do we have time to to say something else or quickly Yes. Yeah. Okay. 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 Yes. I mean, but but by, by symmetry of the law, I was just referring to this idea that you can map solution into solution, and you look at the whether this mapping uh, preserve the structure, but you don't care about, for example, boundary condition or initial condition that you can have in specific models. So it's like a more, uh, yeah, structural property of uh, of of the theories, but but you are yeah. not very engaged in the in the physical cases in which you're pick some particular boundary condition, blah, blah, blah. So you have this, this movement, right? You can have symmetry of the laws, but don't not, you cannot have, for example, symmetry of models or the other way around, blah, blah, blah. Good. So okay, I think well, it was very clear what you said. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, perhaps as a follow-up to that, I mean, there's a, there's a place that people talk about symmetries of the laws and symmetries of states. And I think one piece of physics practice that hasn't had that much attention on the more metaphysical side of the symmetry literature is that there's an intermediate space where we our symmetry leaves the sector invariant, yeah, yeah. invariant if you like but doesn't leave the um uh does, doesn't leave the individual states invariant yeah yeah okay mm -hmm. i think those, those are actually quite important and a lot of the a lot of the sort of for, for instance that if you're running nurtus theorem to work out the conserve quantities you definitely need to be running it on a, a some symmetries of the sector and not just abstract symmetries of all the laws <laughs> okay thanks great Okay, uh, and maybe the last question, Adam. Okay, uh, thank you, David. Um, very nice talk. I, I love your papers on, on symmetries. Uh, I, I have a, a general question, um, um, uh, very briefly. Uh, your, your argument goes for, from uh, formal properties of, of symmetries and, and tries to get some, some conclusions about uh, conditions on observability of symmetries. I was wondering what you think about re trying to reverse the logic of the of the argument, trying to impose starting from some conditions, general conditions on observability, and try to get uh, from the argument some uh, formal conditions on symmetries. Uh, have you thought about it? Uh, do you think it's a good project? Thank you. Yeah, so I um, mean, uh, I think there are places where I think that, that that's viable. I mean, I mean, the, the classic example, if you like, is Galileo's ship. Um, so Galileo didn't have a systematic boost covariant dynamics. Uh, what he had was a bunch of observational data that made it compelling the boost for symmetries. By the way, I think this is a really good example of how it's helpful. It's, it's probably better in most cases to think about symmetries as applied to particular subsystems. Obviously, Galileo had no evidence as what would happen if God put the universe in uniform motion, but he knew what happened on actual ships. Um, so that's very much a case where we seem to have empirical evidence of boosts of symmetries, and so we want to build that into our laws. Um, and you could think later that, to some extent, that's the logic of um, Einstein 1905. We've got empirical evidence that boosts remain symmetries even in the electromagnetic sector. How we build that into laws and reconcile it with the um, its source independence of the speed of light. Um, where I think that project gets off the rails is if, if one starts bringing in sort of a prioristic ideas as to what's unobservable. I mean, in some sense, um, observability is always going to be like, what do we see? 
um what do we see in the in the world um uh what can we what transformations don't really seem to make a difference now and then how um, and then how, how can we boost that up to the level of dynamics and i think yeah, a lot of post-war particle physics you could probably put in this kind of framework you know we had a bunch of the, the fact that the proton and neutron had very similar mass was pretty good evidence for an approximate symmetry of the equations because otherwise it would just be a freakish coincidence. You know, no, nothing mathematically would prevent you just saying, well, we'll just stipulatively put the proton and neutron mass almost the same, but that's a pretty weird coincidence. So it becomes pretty plausible that there's some symmetry relation understanding of that. You know, the discovery of the sort of the, the, the eightfold way families of hadrons is pretty good evidence for symmetry. So I think, so I think that project properly epistemically mod modestly carried out and based upon context dependent evidence for specific unobservabilities um is extremely important and has played a big role all the way through physics what what i don't think we can do is is, is suppose that we we know what the unobservable con what, what's observable and what isn't by the natural light and then build a physics around it you know we, we've tried that at various points we got burned i mean parity is the classic example <clears throat> thank you okay uh yeah, the, the, yeah, so this part is a discussion, then we can perhaps finish there. Okay. Uh, if you could stop sharing, I would. Oh, I'm sorry, sure. Um, uh, let me break out of it. I'm sorry, I didn't catch you. Request. Uh, here we go. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, yeah. So thank you for uh, the talk and for answering.